Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Roger Downs. I'm the conservation director with the Sierra Club Atlantic chapter. Uh, we're going to give it a few moments to let att attendees file on, uh, but, but thank you for attending uh, this important informational webinar. Um, we will begin shortly. Um, I just want everyone to know that uh, there will be uh, quite a few attendees. Uh, if you have questions, we will go through the program. Uh, please, in the question bar, uh, ask questions of our speakers, and uh, we will try to get all to, to all the questions. Um, and uh, and maybe if there's time, we we can take additional uh, comments or questions. But we'll get going in in just a moment. So I would like to introduce Kate Bartholomew. Kate is the chair of the Sierra Club Atlantic chapter, uh, and she will introduce our speakers uh, today. Um, so take it away, Kate. Thank you, Roger. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm also a member of the Finger Lakes group, which is where the Hakes landfill is located. Um, normally, when there's a gathering of 20 or more uh, Sierra Club members. Uh, we do an, a land acknowledgement recognizing the uh, indigenous peoples who have uh, occupied the land before we uh, acquired it um, illegitimately. But in lieu of that today, um, I would ask us to take a moment of silence in recognition of those folks who are being impacted by the uh, coronavirus pandemic in the state and the, the country and the world. So uh, let's pause for a moment. Thank you. The first speaker I would like to introduce is Rachel Trichler. Rachel Treichler is a member of the Atlantic Chapter Legal Committee, and she is also a Finger Lakes Group member and one of the attorneys working on the Hakes lawsuit. So she's going to explain a bit about the, what's going on um, legally with the um, situation. Go ahead, Rachel. Thank you, Kate. And I'd like to give a big thank you to Dr. David Carter and Dr. Raymond Vaughn for taking the time to give us this webinar today. Both Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Vaughn are expert witnesses in our lawsuit um, that's been brought by the Sierra Club, People for a Healthy Environment, and Concerned Citizens of Allegheny County to challenge the expansion of the Hakes Landfill. Our lawsuit contends that the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation violated the State Environmental Quality Review Act, CICRA, when DEC failed to investigate the evidence of high levels of radium and radon in the landfill uh, that's shown in the landfill's leachate test results um, before they approved the landfill expansion project. If the judge agrees with us, um, he will revoke the landfill's expansion permit. If the judge disagrees with us, he will dismiss our lawsuit. The filing of papers in the lawsuit has been suspended, and the courts are generally on hold now due to the coronavirus situation. So we don't know when the lawsuit will sort of uh, come back online. Um, but uh, we have filed the affidavits of Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Vaughn uh, to explain why they think that more testing is needed and they are going to explain this to us in person today so thank you very much to both of them thank you rachel um so our first speaker and many thanks for being able to be on this webinar dr vaughn 
is a licensed professional geologist and environmental scientist in Buffalo. His familiarity with the physical and quantitative properties of radionuclides and the alpha, beta, and gamma radiation they emit is based partly on work relating to radionuclides that he performed between 2000 and 2012 when he was employed as the environmental scientist at the New York State Attorney General's office, partly on consulting work he has done to review and interpret radiological test results, and partly on technically oriented volunteer work he has performed for several decades as a member of the Coalition on West Valley Nuclear Waste from 1978 to 2006, and as a member of the West Valley Citizens Task Force from 1997 to the present. He was appointed to the West Valley Citizen Task Force by the US Department of Energy and the New York State Energy Research and Development Administration, otherwise known as NYSERDA. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Vaughn. Please take it away. Thank you, Kate. Uh, this is Ray Vaughn. So uh, we're talking today about the Hakes and Shemong landfills, which are in the vicinity of Corning and Elmira, New York. Next slide, please. And uh, we see strong evidence of high levels of radium and radon in both of these landfills. Most of my work has been done on the Hakes landfill, but we also see the same phenomenon occurring with the Shemong landfill. So DEC and the landfill operator disagree with the evidence that uh, we have uncovered here. Uh, they're relying on a completely different line of evidence. And DEC actually has a process for resolving uh, disputed issues of fact, the uh, adjudicatory hearing process, but they haven't uh, followed up on this. It's unfortunate this is really a, a process, process that is well designed for resolving issues such as this. So taking a big overview of this, radon testing of landfill gas from the Hakes landfill and also Shemung landfill is a crucial for, first step that would be needed to resolve these questions of fact. And we also need testing of leachate, which Rachel referred to by EPA method 901.1 to be resumed. This is a type of testing that uh, has detected high levels of lead 214. You'll notice that I'm using the uh, chemical abbreviation PB for lead. So when I talk about uh, lead 214, you'll see it on the screen often as PB 214, but also bismuth 214, BI 214. These are tests that were done until mid 2018 by the landfill operator uh, as required by DEC. But DEC and the operator have discontinued these crucial tests. So this type of leachate testing needs to be resumed in addition to starting up some radon testing of landfill gas. Next slide, please. So our evidence is uh, that the radon levels in landfill leachate are intermittently very high, indicating that radon levels in landfill gas not just the leachate, but also the landfill gas are also high. And since radon comes from radium, the radium in the landfill must also be high. So that's the basis of our understanding of um, this issue. DEC, on the other hand, claims that their regulatory limit for radium and waste, which is 25 picocuries per gram, is met. And they believe that this is enforced by the radiation monitoring instruments at the landfill gates, but we don't find these monitors effective. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of the type of radioactivity monitoring at the uh, landfill gate. The trucks entering with waste need to pass through these radiation monitors in order, in order to check on the radium levels in the waste. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the radiation monitoring uh, with these monitors is that the incoming waste loads would be shown to have no more than 25 picocuries per gram radium in the waste load. But the problem is that this type of monitoring uh, can't serve the intended purpose because there are highly variable and very inconsistent levels of lead 214 and bismuth 214 that interfere with the radium monitoring. It's not quite as straightforward as having the truck drive through and all that is being detected is radium. There are other radionuclides, uh, particularly these two, that complicate the radium uh, monitoring and radiological measurements at the gate. And the result of this is that waste truck loads uh, can vary up to a factor of 60 in their radium levels while exhibiting the same or similar monitor readings at the gate. 
So it's just not a test that is uh, discriminating properly, focusing on radium as opposed to these other radionuclides. Next slide. So their method of monitoring is simply not reliable. And our evidence, as I've already said, indicates more radium than DEC is acknowledging. And this is based on the radium, excuse me, the radon levels in landfill leachate that are intermittently very high. Again, uh, indicating radon levels must be high. And since radon comes from radium, the radium in the landfill must be high. As I mentioned, most of the data I've reviewed is from Hakes, but Shimong also has uh, leachate tests that have shown intermittently high radon. That landfill likewise needs attention here. Next slide. So the graph at the bottom here shows uh, part of what I'm talking about, but the context is that between 2012 and mid-2018, when DEC and the operator stopped doing this, land, this leachate testing, there were about 106 different tests. And I'm showing you here in this graph 22 that are the highest readings out of these 106 tests before lead 214 and bismuth 214. These 22 just happen to be the ones that are above 100 picocuries per liter. And as you can see, they range way above 100, up to about 6,000 picocuries per liter. And the other uh, 84, if I showed them on this, would be you know, much lower. They'd be lower than the lowest ones you see here. So I'm just focusing on this to illustrate the high ones. but. Uh, 22 out of 106 is not a trivial number. And to have you know, uh, two of these 22 tests being way up at around 6,000 picocuries per liter is certainly a huge part of the issue. And this is what we consider very important evidence DEC and the landfill operator have not been willing to really focus on. So the, the lower ones, the other 84 samples that are not shown in this graph, as I say, are below 100 picocuries per leader for both lead 214 and bismuth 214. These other 84 averaged around 16 picocuries per liter. So they were ranging overall from just a few picocuries per liter up to 100. And as I say, these ones you're seeing here are the ones that are over 100. And these are not shown in any kind of time sequence. These are just shown from lowest to highest. And as I say, there'd be 84 more to the further to the left to show the true low end of this. Next slide, please. So here's the same set of data, the same 22 samples that are over 100 picocuries per uh, liter in the leachate, but shown in the time sequence from 2012 to 2017. There would be a few more straggling on at the right end that are low levels that were recorded up to mid-2018. And then there are others that would be interspersed among these results that are the low levels of the 84 that tested at lower levels than you're seeing here. So in both graphs, the one I showed, them, showed you on the previous slide, but also on this one, you'll see that the blue color represents the lead 214 and the orange color represents the business 214. And you notice that when one of these two is high, the other is also high. So it's not like uh, in any given sample, there's a huge discrepancy from lead 214 and business 214. This is the fact that these two uh, radionuclides stay in sync with each other, so to speak. When one is high, the other is also high is a good indication that we're not seeing spurious test results here. We have good reason to believe that, uh, or I shouldn't say believe, we have good reason to understand that the lead 214 and bismuth 214 will typically be high together or low together in any given sample. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So you can see that these uh, high results are sporadic and intermittent in ways that really need to be resolved. Next slide, please. So uh, part of what was on the last couple of slides that I didn't really emphasize is that the radium levels in all of these leachate samples are low, only a few picocuries per gram, generally on the order of three to four picocuries per, uh, not per gram, but per liter. So these leachate samples that are showing up to 6,000 picocuries per liter of lead 214 and bismuth 214 are at the same time showing very low levels of radium, namely around three to four picocuries per liter of radium. So that brings me to what I'm saying here, that the, the low radium test results may seem reassuring, but aren't because of the high and variable levels of uh, lead-214 and bismuth-214. And the importance of this is because lead and bismuth-214 are produced by radioactive decay 
of radium and radon. And all four of these radionuclides are part of the same radioactive decay chain. That's why we can't simply say, oh, radium is testing low in all the leachate samples. Uh, we need to pay attention as well to the lead-214 and bismuth-214 levels. And that's uh, the major part of our evidence here, which is strongly scientifically supported. Next, please. So we need to look at the uranium-238 uranium decay series. And you can see that as uh, uranium-238 turns into thorium-234, turns into protactinium, 234M and so on down the list. There's a huge variety of so-called half-lives ranging from 4.5 billion years for uranium-238 to a matter of days for thorium-234, matter of minutes for protactinium, et cetera. So this is a series that eventually runs down through radium and radon and ends up at lead-206. We talk about uh, the parent radionuclide as being at the top or the head of the series. And if we're talking about the whole series, we'd be talking about uranium-238 as the parent, and then thorium and protactinium and so on and so on would be the progeny. Or if we're just talking about the immediate next step, it would be called the daughter of the decay product. Uh, but the same terminology can be used if we're only talking about part of the list, which is what we're doing today. So we can talk, for example, about, uh, excuse me, we can talk today about uh, radium-226 as being the parent and then its immediate progeny or daughter is radon-222, and then the next progeny in the line are polonium-218, lead-214, bismuth-214, et cetera. So you can see why all of these uh, ones I've been talking about in the previous slides are important here, because uh, they are... I've lost the image on my slide. I'll need to make take a second here. Hang on a second. Okay, back in business here. The uh, part of the list that we're most concerned about, uh, next slide, please. Part of the list that we're most concerned about here is the one that runs from uh, radium-226 on downward. And uh, these are the ones that are highlighted in red on the left side of the screen, starting with radium with a half-life of 100, uh, excuse me, 1,600 years on down to radon-222. This is the ordinary radon that uh, is so much in the news with a half-life of only 3.8 days. And radon, as you recall, is a gas. But in turn, when that decays, we're getting into solid materials again, such as polonium-218, lead-214, bismuth-214. And uh, I think that's all for now. Next slide, please. So. It's important to be able to account for the radioactive atoms within the decay chain. And it's important to remember that during radioactive decay, atoms are transformed into a new type of atom. They don't just disappear entirely. And likewise, the atoms don't simply appear out of nowhere. So given this continuity uh, from a parent atom to a progeny atom, accounting for these atoms can always be done, at least in principle. It's simplest when the atoms are either trapped in solid rock or sealed in a sample of jar for long enough to reach what's called secular equilibrium. But even when secular equilibrium is not achieved, accounting can and should be done for the atoms uh, when we're trying to figure out what's happening in a case like this where radium in leachate is testing very low. Some of its progeny, its daughter products, are testing very high. Next slide, please. So secular equil equilibrium, an important concept here, occurs if and when a relatively long-lived parent uh, radionuclide, such as radium, is enclosed, as I said a minute ago, in a tight geologic matrix, such as solid rock, or in a sealed container. This would keep the progeny, such as radon, trapped very close to the parent. When this condition occurs, we can say after a sufficient time interval, that the activity of the progeny in picocuries will be the, about the same as the activity of the parent. So the progeny effectively stay in sync, meaning they have the same number of picocuries on down the decay chain when these conditions of secular equilibrium are met. 
And even if the progeny originally are initially absent, they'll be generated and catch up if the parent is put into a sealed container. That's how secular equilibrium works. Next slide, please. So a couple of uh, time periods that will give you an idea of what we're talking about by a sufficient time period are shown here in red. If we're starting with radium, but none of its progeny in a sealed container, a period of about 21 days is long enough to establish secular equilibrium from radium on down to business 214. In picocaries, this means that the number of picocaries in radium 226 is equal to the number of picocaries in each of the following uh, radionuclides in the decay chain. But if we're leaving off radium 226, but I'll just talking about uh, radon 222 as the parent, a much shorter time period is needed to establish secular equilibrium. So in picocaries, if we've waited a period of five hours where the radon is sealed into a sample container, the number of picocaries of Radon 222 will also be the same number as the picocuries of lead 214, and the same as the picocuries of bismuth 214. And as a result of this, is uh, if the lead 214 and bismuth 214 has these very short half lives, they will be essentially gone within about five hours, if not con if not constantly replenished by radon decay. Any lead 214 or bismuth 214 found in a sample thus must be less than about five hours old. Next slide, please. So here's a way to try to depict how secular equilibrium works and what's going on inside the sealed sample containers that have contained leachate that have been tested and found to contain very high levels of bismuth 214 and lead 214. So if you look at the top pane here, the top panel, imagine that there's a system of conveyor belts and bins containing sand. And these bins just happen to have these strange numbers and letters painted on them, uh, like RA226 and RN222, but the operators of the system don't necessarily understand what these bin labels refer to, because after all, we're talking about bins of sand. And the first bin of sand has uh, about a couple hundred uh, pounds of sand in it with about 2.7 billion grains of sand constituting these uh, few hundred pounds of sand. And then there's a little conveyor belt that's conveying 2.2 sand grains per minute over into the next bin, which is the one that is labeled RN222. And so on uh, down the line of bins, these conveyor belts are conveying 2.22 gram, uh, grains of sand per minute from left to right in the sequence of bins. So on average, the different bins are containing the number of, there's a little bit of feedback here. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but the, I hear myself repeated at about a minute delay. But in any case, the uh, the bins on average will show the, will contain the number of uh, grains of sand that are shown here in my numbers, 2.7 billion, 17,600, 10, 86, 63. So quite variable numbers of grains of sand in these bins being conveyed from left to right, from bin to bin, ending up in the lead 210PB210 bin that will end up having about 37 million grains of sand at any given moment. So the point of all this is that if we switch to the lower pane, the same analog or the same conceptual model will show you how the decay chain works. And we're, do we're talking about now atoms of the different radionuclides being contained in the different bins and being conveyed down from left to right uh, into the next bin. So the same numbers pertain. And on, at any given moment, the number of uh, atoms you would expect to find in any one of these bins is the number you see inside the bin, such as 17,600 or 10 or 86. So that's just a conceptual way to explain how the decay chain works. Remember though, this is just an analog. The atoms aren't really moving in space. They're just moving in time down through the decay chain. Next slide, please. So the top pane here 
is exactly the same as the last one that I showed, except that I've now replaced the 2.22 uh, atoms per minute into a percentage. The percentage represents the percentage of the source bin that is being conveyed per minute along the conveyor belt into the next bin. So enough said on the top panel. But now look at the bottom panel. What I've shown in yellow here is one of the conveyor belts is now broken. So there's no longer any conveyance of atoms from RA226 to RA222, or excuse me, RN222. What has happened here is that the secular equilibrium that we've had in the preceding illustrations here has just been lost. Or at T equals zero, the exact moment this conveyor belt has failed. So at the moment, at least, the downstream numbers of uh, atoms in the bin stay the same, but they will quickly uh, start to be depleted, depending, of course, on how many are there to start with. But uh, they will be depleted because there's no longer any supply of atoms coming from the RA226 bin anymore. The diagram here shows the lost RA226 atoms just falling onto the ground, but next slide, please. In reality, what's happened is that they are simply going someplace else. In effect, there's a new decay chain that's been established because the uh, the old one has been cut off and the decay of radium-226 into radon-222 is now moving in a new place. And to talk about why this might actually happen in rea reality, it has to do with the fact that radon is a gas. So unless the radium and the radon and the others are truly sealed into a tight container, if they're, for example, in a pile of material or in a truckload, uh, the radon is likely to be at least partly escaping as a gas and no longer in the same sealed enclosure as would be needed to ensure secular equilibrium. So uh, next slide, please. And remember that the bin and conveyor belt analogies on the preceding slides are just for a single picocarrier, one picocarrier. And if you ever want to try this for larger numbers of picocarriers, just multiply by that number. The numbers will all stay proportional. Next slide, please. So coming back to what I've just been showing in this bin and conveyor belt analogy, uh, this is just a simpler way of portraying it back more to what I was talking about initially with the decay chain sequences. At secular equilibrium, the top number one chain shown here, one picocarry of uh, radium-226 decays, and if, if it is at e uh, secular equilibrium, uh, will then decay into one picocarry of radium, excuse me, radon-222 and so on down through the decay chain, one picocarry. Uh, throughout the chain as expected at secular equilibrium. But now if we lose secular equilibrium between radium and radon, at T equals zero, the exact instant this is lost, there's still no time for any change to occur. But looking now at the number three chain, again, secular equilibrium has been lost for a period of 3.82 days, which happens to be the half-life of radon. So the downstream radionuclides in the decay chain are now down to 0.5, in other words, one half picocurie. These others are all assumed to still be in secular equilibrium with one another. And if you recall, you need only about five hours worth of uh, secular equilibrium to guarantee that the few radionuclides downstream from radon-222 are going to remain in secular equilibrium with one another. So they're still all at 0.5, even though uh, they have lost the replenishment from radium-226. Number four here, the secular equilibrium has now been lost for 21 days, and we're down to much lower levels in the radon and other radionuclides that have now lost any replenishment from the radium. We're down now to 0 0.022 picocuries in all four of these downstream radionuclides. And as would be expected, since they still are in secular equilibrium with one another, they're all equal numbers of picocuries. Next slide, please. So applying these radiological principles to the Hake's leachate results, we'll finally get back to the direct Hake's uh, results. 
but we'll do this by looking at uh, two panes here, both of which I've shown you already. So the top one is what I've just shown you about uh, how secular equilibrium being lost between radium and its uh, radon daughter, how that will uh, affect the phycocarrier measurements after a period of 21 days. And 21 days is important because that's the holding period for the Higgs samples that were being collected for uh, leachate testing. In other words, a leachate sample would be collected, put into a sealed container, held for 21 days, and then tested after uh, at the end of the 21-day period. So what you see here is exactly what I described a minute ago. The radon on down is at 0 0.022 picocuries because it has lost the supply from radon, excuse me, from radium at the head of the decay chain. So how do we apply this to the results that we're seeing in the leachate tests that were done between 2012 and mid 2018? Next slide, please. Top panel remains the same, but the bottom panel here shows what we know and what we need to fill in the blanks on. So at the very bottom here, the leachate sample at the time of sample testing, 21 days after sample collection, we know that radon, uh, excuse me, we don't have data for radon. That has never been directly tested in the leachate. But we do know that the radium, RA226, shows up consistently low in these 106 or so leachate samples are tested up until mid-2018. So around three picocuries per liter of radium-226 is a test result. And we also had these test results ranging up to, in two of the samples, 6,000 picocuries per liter or, or a little bit more. So we need to fill in the blanks on the others, including in the third line here, uh, what were the radionuclide levels at the time of sample collection. We have them at the 21 days, but we need to know at t equals zero, the date the samples were collected. Next slide, please. So I filled in what we can determine based on the scientific principles I've already been describing in the last several minutes. We know that since the leachate samples were in sealed containers, that the radi radon-222 and polonium-218 and lead-214 and bismuth-214 all need to be about the same number of picocuries. So since we knew that lead-214 and bismuth-214 were 6,000, we can fill in radon-222 and polonium as well as having been at 6,000 at the time of sample testing. And we know, of course, that radium was tested at about three picocuries per liter. So at the time of sample collection, the radium has such a sh uh, long half-life that it does not change substantially in 21 days. That has to be the same as when it was tested. So we can fill in three picocuries per liter there. And then the others had to have been around 270,000 picocuries per liter, far higher. This is needed because there was no radium to replenish them. At most, radium can, could contribute around three picocuries per liter to the 6,000 or 270,000 found in the in the progeny measurements. But the inevitable result of being in a, con, a sealed container for 21 days is that if the measurements at the end are showing 6,000 picocuries per liter, there must have been 270,000 picocuries per liter at the beginning of this sealed sample, in other words, of the date when it was collected. Next, please. Another way to show you this uh, is that the decay curve for radon is the way to depict this. What we know is at the far right end, we are testing uh, leachate samples and finding 6,000 picocuries per liter. But of course, this is 21 days after the samples were collected. So we need to look back up the curve. And when we do that, we find that looking back up the curve, we need to have had 270,000 picocuries per liter of I think we're one down. slide behind. I think we should have the slide with the curve on it. I think we're one slide behind. 
Yes, I'm sorry about that since I my screen has gone dark for reasons I can't immediately ascertain. But thank you for that correction. Okay. So again, this is uh, the decay curve for radon 222 without replenishment from the parent radium. There's simply nowhere near enough radium at three picocuries per liter to be able to account for these very high values of radon and bismuth 214 and lead 214. So the important points here, uh, I'm on the next slide, I think I just said that, important points, uh, leachate and landfill gas. The radon activity in Hake's leachate from which samples were collected is intermittently very high, ranging up to about 270,000 picocuries per liter. So there's no way around that relationship. It's part of the accounting that can be stated quite clearly once you look at the relationships among the radionuclides and the decay chain running from radium on down through uh, bismuth 214. We also know that since radon is a radioactive gas, it is governed by some of the other physical chemistry laws uh, that control how it mixes with air or landfill gas in this case, and how it dissolves in water and water-based mixtures such as leachate. So some of these physical chemistry relationships involve the partition coefficient and Henry's law. These are really two different ways of approaching the same question, which is if you've got a high amount of a gas, such as radon in this case, in a liquid, it will also have an equilibrium concentration uh, for any adjoining or overlying quantity of gas, such as air or landfill gas. And the Relationships of partition coefficient and Henry's law are measured in lab conditions at equilibrium for air and water. We're talking here about uh, two other substances that are good approximations. Instead of water per se, it's leachate. Instead of air, it's landfill gas. Next slide, please. But this will show you the relationship that occurs uh, at equilibrium at 20 degrees C in a sealed container where what's shown in blue below is 270,000 picocuries per liter. That's the concentration of radon in the water. And that's what we're understanding to be the case in the Hake's leachate at the time of sample collection, indicating that if the overlying air or landfill gas uh, at the time of sample collection has had enough time to establish equilibrium. We're now looking at 100, excuse me, 1.05 million picocuries per liter of radon in the air or the landfill gas. So a little over a million picocuries per liter is what we're looking at here. Next slide, please. This is a slide that starts out not at full equilibrium. So what we're looking at here is how to explain the presence of very high levels of radon with the very low measurements of radium in the leachate. And this diagram shows the best available interpretation, which is that the generation of radon from radium is occurring primarily within the air and landfill gas. In other words, the radium atoms that are decaying to radon are not submerged. They're not immersed in the leachate. They're higher up in the landfill in what we're calling a high and dry location. And the radium is thus out of easy reach of the leachate. That's the only easy way to explain why there's so little radium measured in the leachate samples consistently throughout all 106 leachate samples. The radium is extremely low, yet we're seeing these phenomenally high levels of radon in at least some of the samples. So this is the best available interpretation of how that's happening. The radon is being generated in the upper part of the landfill and one way or another being carried down toward the leachate and then the equilibrium relationship between 1.05 million picocuries per liter in air versus 270,000 
by Kukiris per liter in leachate. Uh, we'll explain how this can occur without having the parent radium actually immersed in the leachate. Next slide, please. So again, important points, uh, emphasizing these again, the radon activity in landfill gas within the landfill likely exceeds 1 million picocuries per liter, either most of the time or part of the time. But we don't know how much is escaping through the cap and how much is being released from the landfill gas flare. As some of you may know, the uh, landfill gas is constantly being generated in the Hakes landfill is collected in a piping system sent to a flare. A lot of the landfill gas is methane, so it will burn and landfill uh, practice, you know, recommends burning it to get rid of the methane because it's a potent greenhouse gas and sometimes it's used as an energy source. But in any case, uh, we don't have test results on how much radon is in the landfill gas. So we need to know how much is uh, there. And so testing is needed for that purpose. So testing and air dispersion modeling are needed not only to determine how much radon is in the landfill gas itself, but in the constituents of the landfill gas that are flowing down wind. Remember that the flare will destroy or combust methane but it will not affect radon. Radon passes through a flame such as occurs at the landfill gas flare without being affected. So whatever radon was in the landfill gas as it emerges through the piping and through the flare will continue downwind. And we need testing and air dispersion modeling to determine the radon levels and the health risks at downwind locations. But also given the fact that due to the accounting principles I've been talking about, since radon comes from radium decay, uh, we don't know how much radium is in the Hakes landfill, but we knew, do know that since the so-called conveyor belts keep running, uh, we do need to account for what is the source of what we find to be high levels of radon and bismuth and lead in the leachate. There needs to be a, radi a radium source for that material. So that material, uh, that radium needs to be measured in the landfill itself. And just to emphasize, radium is a long-term issue because of its 1600 year half-life. The conveyor belts then keep producing the, uh, the progeny, starting with radon, then it's moving down toward lead 214 and bismuth 214. These conveyor belts keep running for thousands of years. Next slide, please. This slide will show you uh, how long it takes for the radium 226 levels to fall with this long 1600 year half life. It takes about 16,000 years for radium 226 to decline to negligible levels. So, what I'm showing here is a actually calendar year starting in the year 2000 along the bottom axis running out through year 4,000, uh, 4, year 6,000, et cetera, on out to the year 18,000. So it takes a long, long time for this parent radium-226, which is always churning out radon and the other daughter products before that really falls to negligible levels. Next slide, please. And just to put that in a little bit better perspective, if we're looking only at the current century from the year 2000 to the year 2100, if we started out, just for terms of reference, if we started out with 1,000 picocuries in the year 2000, that would only decline to about 958 picocuries in the year 2100. Or to put it another way, if we start out with any given quantity in the year 2000, uh, there would still be 95.8% of that radium left undecayed uh, 100 years after the beginning point, in other words, in the year 2100. So the matter of radium-226 in the landfill is not just a short-term issue, you know, which is what we're mostly looking at at the moment. The need for testing is mostly to establish the current levels, but whatever the amount of radium is in the landfill as determined by modern day testing will help define this issue that continues for thousands of years. 
Next slide, please. And it's unfortunate that we don't have test results for this landfill, but it's also absent for most landfills. <clears throat> There's very little information available on radon in landfill gas, and likewise on radon emission rates through the caps and vents of landfills that have drilling waste. There is, however, a useful landfill modeling study that Walder et al. did in the year 2012 that looks at radon emissions from a modeled landfill. This is you know, not an actual landfill that they're measuring, but a landfill model that they've created that tracks the uh, movement of radon, both within the landfill and downwind. And the model landfill that they look at actually contains about twice as much drilling waste and apparently more, but you'll notice my red question mark here, apparently more radium than is present in the Lakes Hakes landfill. So you can see the measurements here, the landf landfill gas emission rate in standard cubic feet per minute is r roughly twice the current level at Hakes, but Hakes is projected to expand up to about 750, which would actually put it above the Walder et al. level. The drill cuttings or gas development waste in tons for Hakes is in the neighborhood of 77,000, and Walder et al. are assuming about twice that amount, around 165,000 tons of gas development waste. And Hakes, according to DEC, is taking in only waste that has less than 25 picocuries per gram. Walder et al. were assuming that their model landfill actually contains twice that amount, 50 picocuries per gram. Next slide, please. But we're not seeing uh, the type of proportionality we would expect here in the sense that, as the title on this slide says, the radon emission should be roughly proportional to radium in landfill waste, all else being equal. Since radon comes from radium, you do need to have some kind of relationship between radium and radon. So you'd expect the radon emission to be roughly proportional to radium, all else being equal. All else being equal is something we certainly wouldn't expect to see in real life, but it's a good starting approximation. And as we'll see here in the, this slide and the next one, we're so far from being proportional, it really raises questions about what's going on in terms of meeting the 25 picocuries per gram limit that DEC believes is enforceable at the site. So what we're seeing comparing the actual Hakes landfill with the model landfill from Walder et al. is that the landfill that not only accepts less radium, namely Hakes, has far more radium in its landfill gas emissions than are seen in the model landfill by Walder et al. So with Hakes, uh, the radon activity in the landfill gas likely exceeds about 1 million picocuries per liter, either most of the time or part of the time. That's what I showed in the last several slides. The landfill gas emission rate at Walder et al. At Walder et al. can be combined with their range of radon emission rates to generate a radon concentration in their landfill gas. They don't show this specifically, but they do provide the two numbers that uh, allow their radon concentration to be calculated exactly. So from about 300 to about 20,000 picocuries per liter is what the Walder et al. model landfill contains. And that's a huge difference compared to what we're seeing for Hakes of about 1 million picocuries per liter. Again, keep in mind the caveat that all else being equal may not be true exactly, but it's a good starting point. And we're seeing this huge discrepancy between up to 1 million picocuries per liter uh, in the Hakes like landfill and only about 300 to 20,000 picocuries per liter in the model's landfill. Next slide, please. So just look at the middle of the uh, rough table I've put together here with the three columns, one labeled at limit Hakes, the next two with the over uh, title proportional for Walder et al. and then for Hakes. So look at the at limit Hakes column. This is what is being reported 
uh, at least for the radium in the waste, less than 25 picocuries per gram. And the rate on the landfill gas, 1 million, that's what we're finding, not what DEC is acknowledging. But then look over to the Walder et al. column. The two different radon and landfill gas concentrations, either 300 or 20,000, are what we can determine from the Walder et al. study. And that is for a landfill that is taking 50 picocuries per gram radium in their waste. And you can see that the landfill with the lower nominal amount of radium in the waste, namely Hakes, is the one that's showing the much higher landfill gas concentration. If we were to look at what would be required, all else being equal, to bring the Hakes radium up in proportion to the Walder et al. radium, what we'd be looking at is the likelihood of uh, the radium in the Hakes waste ranging between 2,500 and 175,000 picocuries per gram. So that's way above what we're being led to believe is in the Hakes landfill. Again, keep in mind this comparison assumes, assumes all else being equal, which is not likely, but it illustrates the difficulty of reconciling 1 million picocuries per liter radon in landfill gas with the nominal radium acceptance level, level, level and waste of 25 picocuries per gram. Next slide, please. So important points here, the radon activity in Hake's leachate is intermittently high, ranging up to 20, uh, 270,000 picocuries per liter. The radon activity in the landfill gas likely exceeds 1 million, either most of the time or part of the time. And we need testing to determine how much escapes to the cap, how much is released from the landfill gas flare. And again, as I've just been saying, this quantity or this concentration of 1 million picocuries per liter radon in the landfill gas cannot be easily reconciled with the 25 picocuries per gram radium limit. We need a better determination of uh, whether this limit has actually been met or whether we're seeing far more than 25 picocuries per gram radium in this landfill. As I said a few months ago, radium is an issue not just for the near term, but for thousands of years. Next slide, please. So in wrapping up here, let's take, just take a quick look at why lead-214 and bismuth 214 are only intermittently high and not continually high in the leachate test results. Number one explanation, which is likely, is that the, some of the test samples have not been properly sealed. So the sample jars held for 21 days before testing. At least some of these sample jars have apparently allowed radon gas to escape from the samples before testing, and that's why the lead-214 and bismuth-214 results are low in some of those sample jars. That's probably not the case with all the samples. So the number two explanation almost certainly applies as well, and that is the levels of radon gas in the landfill vary over time, depending upon the opening and closing of various pathways that allow radon to reach the leachate and then to escape to the atmosphere. As the landfill operates, uh, you know, part of the time there's uncovered waste and the surfaces and caps are constantly changing in the landfill, so it would not be surprising for the levels of radon gas to vary over time in the landfill. But keep in mind, if even if this is happening, the conveyor belts in this analogy are constantly running. So whatever radium is in the landfill is constantly producing radon and so on with the other progeny. And if we're detecting radon as our clue as to what's happening, we always need to be able to trace that back to its radium source. So when we say that levels of radon gas in the landfill may vary over time, it's not like that can just happen magically. Uh, we need to account for the source radium and keep in mind that that source radium will constantly being gener be constantly be generating a predictable amount of radon. Next slide, please. So there are lots of unknowns here, and we've talked about some of the testing that's needed, but just to recap, the exposure pathways to humans have not been clearly identified or adequately investigated, but clearly they cause some level of downwind human exposure. Whether it's truly significant, we don't know yet, but uh, it certainly needs to be 
measured in view of the evidence we have so far. So both the exposure level and the risk are needed. We need measurements on those. And then radium poses a long-term risk for thousands of years if landfill integrity can't be guaranteed. So in answering some of these questions, we need to know where the radium is. Is it truly in a high and dry location in the landfill? What are the levels of radium? You know, are the quantities somewhere near what would be uh, controlled by a 25 picocuri per gram waste acceptance limit, or are they way above that? And what are the long-term exposure and risk? And also, we, as part of understanding all this, we need a better understanding of the landfill gas flow pathways through which radon moves through the landfill, reaches the leachate, and escapes the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So many unknowns and testing this needed uh, more specifically is we need to know the radon level, the emission rate, in other words, at the landfill flare. That would be the most efficient place to have either continuous or frequent monitoring to measure the radon level in the landfill gas moving out through the flare. That's really the key point that needs to be tested. But we also need modeling, and that's the best way to get quick results, uh, usually reliable results of how any radon emerging from the landfill flare will disperse and what its concentrations downwind will be. Next, we clearly need resumption of the gamma spectroscopy testing that was done up until mid-2018. That's what has detected the lead-214 and bismuth-214 and leachate. Uh, without that testing, we've really lost the ability to detect radium decay products in the leachate. And this has created a blind spot in the radiological monitoring. And even though I've given far less attention here to Shemung landfill, that also needs testing modeling along the takes. So next slide, I think we're on to questions, but I think uh, David Carpenter will take over uh, before we get to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Yes, um, we'll hold questions. So you can write your questions in the chat feature and um, so that we'll get to those after um uh dr carpenter's uh presentation um so dr david carpenter is currently professor of environmental health sciences and director of the institute for health and the environment at the university at albany he previously served as dean of the school of public health at the university of albany from 1985 to 1998 uh, from 1973 to 1980, he served as chair of the Neurobiology Department of the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute, the research arm of the Defense Nuclear Agency, where he directed and performed research on the health effects of ionizing radiation. Because of that background and because of the concern of effects of ionizing radiation resulting from the Three Mile Island nuclear plant incident, in 1980, he was appointed as the director of the Wadsworth Center for Laboratories and the research and research of the New York State Department of Health, where in addition to his other responsibilities, he continued research on health effects of ionizing radiation funded in most part by the Defense Nuclear Agency. So thank you for being here today, Dr. Carpenter, and take it away. Thank you, Kate. Let's have the next slide, please. Uh, Ray's covered a little of this, but let me just show you the atomic and nuclear structure, because this is important in understanding health effects of ionizing radiation. The nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons, and these are traditionally given a weight value of one. Uh, the protons are charged. They have one positive charge. The neutrons, <clears throat> as their name implies, have no charge. <clears throat> and then circulating around in the outside of the nucleus are uh, electrons. And they have a negative charge, but they're very small relative to the protons in the nucleus. About, uh, the protons in nucleus and neutrons are about 1,800 times as heavy as electrons. Now the next slide shows that what we are concerned about are the decay products of these large items <clears throat> like radium and radon. Uh, radium decays to radon by releasing of an alpha particle. 
Now, an alpha particle contains two protons and two neutrons. Therefore, it's a relatively heavy uh, decay product. And it goes swamming off in space, and it hits the body. And because it's relatively heavy and because it's charged, it can cause a lot of damage. Now, beta particles are charged also, but they're very light, so they don't have a lot of momentum like the alpha particles do. So they can penetrate further into the body, but they can also cause damage. Now, it's alpha particles and beta particles that we're concerned about in this decay from radium to radon down to stable lead. The other major uh, form of, of uh, ionizing radiation are gamma rays. These are electromagnetic. So these are packages of energy that don't have any weight, so they can penetrate the body very easily. But we'll not talk more about them. The next slide, please. So this is just a visualization of how radium decays to radon. So radon has four of these elemental particles, protons and neutrons, less than radium. Uh, but you see that radon is still big, and it still has a lot of other protons and neutrons, which then are going to decay further along on that whole sequence that Ray just showed you. But you end up with this alpha particle uh, that's got uh, a fair bit of weight and can cause a lot of damage. Now, the other thing that's important is that radon is a gas. And it's one of the few radioactive substances that is a gas. That is very, very important because that means that you can breathe it in and it can go into your lung. Now, these alpha particles, if, they, if they're outside of the body, they're so heavy that they basically do not penetrate through the skin. And you can get skin cancer if you have intense exposure, and that's happened way in the past, but it's not a major health concern now. But if the radon gas is inhaled into your lung and it releases these alpha particles, it can hit the, the uh, cells of the lung and can cause cancer. And that is a major concern. Next slide, please. So this is just showing those things diagrammatically. The alpha particles, uh, they're actually stopped by a sheet of paper. They, they don't penetrate through your skin. The problem is that if it's deep in your lung, it isn't the skin cell that basically are dead cells. It's, it's those cells that are one, layer, one cell layer thick that uh, are very sensitive to anything that causes cancer causes mutation. The beta, beta particles, they, they're stopped by a layer of clothing, but they will penetrate maybe an inch into a substance like plastic, and they will go perhaps uh, an inch within your body. The gamma rays, they will go right through your body, uh, and they're less likely to hit anything. They don't have any mass. Next slide, please. All right, so radon comes from radium. as, as Ray has just said. Now, the big concern here at the Higgs landfill is that the radium comes from the cuttings in Pennsylvania from the fracking wells. We all know that there are uranium, thorium, radium, the major radioactive elements, deep down in the rock in the core of the Earth. And under the Marcellus Shale, that's a particular problem because there's a lot of these radioactive elements there. So if you're drilling down a mile deep for a fracking well, you're going to get these cuttings come back and they're going to contain these radioactive elements. Now, radium is an additional problem beyond that of, of uh, uranium and thorium because radium is relatively water soluble while the uranium and thorium are not. Uh, but the fact that we have radon coming off the landfill means that there has to be a lot of radium in the landfill because radon only comes from radium through uranium and the other things as well. So uh, the problem with radium 
with radon is that it doesn't have an odor, it doesn't have a color, it doesn't have a taste. So you don't know if it's in the air. It is, has, as Ray said, a half-life of 3.8 days, uh, and the most common route of exposure is inhalation. Now, it also can be present in groundwater. And it's interesting, I have a student in, in Pakistan where people sometimes have very deep wells and where there's actually significant radon in the drinking water in, in some of those places. That's not a major problem here in this country, but uh, the fact that you find radon in the leachate from the landfill is another indication that it, it is water soluble. Radon is about eight times heavier than most other components of the air. And then when it's released, it's not going to migrate immediately up into the atmosphere like some of the less uh, heavy uh, gases that, uh, uh, that can be radioactive. Next slide, please. Now, uh, radiation from natural sources for all of us on, on Earth is primarily from rad radon. Uh, and everyone knows you should test the air in your basement because uh, the radium in the, in the deep rock can generate radon. It can migrate up and uh, come into the basement and you can then breathe it in. So there's some source from cosmic rays. That's not alpha particles. There's some from uh, the Earth directly. There's always a little rate uranium in our drinking water and our food, but radon is the major concern that we have. Next slide. Now, this is showing the same plot that Ray showed a little earlier, but showing it a little differently. So the arrows that point down all involve the release of an alpha particle, one of those particles that contain two protons and two neutrons. The arrows, the arrows that point upward are releases of a beta particle. That is an electron. And so that's also got, it's also radioactive, but it's a particle that has much less weight. And uh, it's not going to stay in the lung quite the way that uh, the radon products will decay. So from uranium-234, you see down through thorium, then radium, and then below that, radon-222. That's what Ray talked about. This is an alpha particle decay. Now, if you inhale the radon and it decays while it's in your lung, it's going to release an alpha particle, can damage your lung, and form polonium-218, but that's also within three minutes going to release another alpha particle and form lead 214, which Ray talked about a lot. Then the lead 214 is going to decay to bismuth 214 with an alpha, with a beta particle decay. With another beta particle, it's going to go to polonium 214, but then another lead uh, decay with an alpha particle. And so on, and you get polonium 210 that's going to decay to lead to 206, which is stable, but with another alpha decay. So if you are inhaling radon 222, and unfortunately it decays while it's in your lung, it's going to generate a total of what is that, five alpha particles, and you're because none of these other products are gases. So they are going to stay right there in your lung. You'll end up with lead 206 in your lung. That's not particularly dangerous. It's a lead isotope, but uh, it's not radioactive. But you will have five, one, two, I, I, said, I said that wrong, it's four. You'll have four alpha particles in your lung from the radon decay. And that is what is of major concern. Next slide, please. So what are the health effects of radon exposure? Well, we know that radioactivity of any sort is a proven human carcinogen. We know that radon exposure is the second most common cause of lung cancer after cigarette smoking. And uh, there have been a number of scientific reports, I actually reviewed them before preparing these slides, 
the best estimates that are about 15% of all cases of lung cancer are due to radon exposure, not due to smoking. Lung cancer is more common in smokers, but it does occur in non-smokers as well. And the major cause of lung cancer in non-smokers is radon exposure. To make matters worse, it's very clear that there is more than an additive interaction between smoking and ionizing radiation exposure. So while a smoker is at elevated risk of lung cancer, and someone that's exposed to radon is at elevated risk of lung cancer. If you both smoke and are exposed to radon, you have more than just the additive risk. These are synergistic risks, uh, very, very dangerous. So alpha particles from radon don't penetrate very far, but deep in the lung, they can directly damage the lung epithelial cells. Radioactivity causes mutations. It directly damages DNA. That's why radiation exposure causes birth defects. Well, when you have a mutation in the DNA in the lung, that becomes a major risk factor for the development of lung cancer. Now, it's interesting that radioactivity exposure is much more dangerous to the young than the old and also to females than males for reasons that are not clear. Let's look at that in the next slide. I, well, I got ahead of myself. Uh, what we know about other effects of ionizing radiation, I'm not going to go in most of those. Cancer is a big concern for radon. But we also know that uh, from animal studies and also support from human studies, the greater ionizing radiation you're exposed to, the shorter your lifespan. And that's not just from cancer. It's from, in, in animal studies, a lot of them done with mice and rats. Uh, when they live a long time, they often die of kidney disease. If they're exposed to radiation, they have more kidney disease. They have more cancer. They have more of this disease than that, more of all of the diseases associated with old age. So radon exposure is not a good thing at any level, even if you don't go on to develop cancer. Next slide. This is a slide showing that the uh, attributable cancer risk is much greater if you're exposed at young age than if you're exposed at old age, and also is much greater in females than males. We don't understand that age, that uh, sex difference. We certainly understand the age difference. Young people's bodies are, are growing and developing. If you, you damage their DNA, it's more likely to express uh, the damage more quickly than, than not. Uh, but at any age, it is not a good idea to have excessive exposure to radioactivity of any matter, certainly not of radon. Next slide. So in conclusion, exposure to any source of ionizing radiation poses threats to human health. The major concern is radiation-induced cancer and for radon, the major cancer of concern is lung cancer, since radon is a gas and it's inhaled. There is some evidence weaker that uh, there might be an elevation in uh, gastrointestinal cancers as well, probably from radioactivity in, uh, in food and drinking water. But clearly for radon, our biggest concern is lung cancer. Cancer uh, that for that's not cancer, for a substance like radon that directly damaged DNA, there is no level of exposure that does not increase risk. This is accepted by EPA and by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. For mutagenic carcinogens, any exposure is going to increase your risk of cancer. It may be at a low level so that in, in a population study you cannot detect it, but because it, the ionizing radiation is damaging DNA. There is no safe level of exposure. Now, we're all exposed to ionizing radiation from cosmic rays from, uh, we have some natural radioactive isotopes in our body. Uh, so we can't avoid some exposure. But what this does mean is that it's extremely important to, to avoid as 
to the greatest de degree, uh, degree possible any increased exposure as that of radon. So the concern from the Higgs landfill, from the Shimung landfill, uh, as Ray indicated, there has to be an enormous generation of radon gas. Sometimes it appears in the leachate, most of the time it does not. Where is it going? It's going into the air. It's being released through the cap. It's going to be released through the vent. You may burn the methane, but you're not going to burn the radon. The winds are going to carry the radon. It's not very, it's very heavy, so it's not going to rise very fast. That means that workers at the site, residents nearby, have an elevated source of exposure to a source of ionizing radiation that's in the air and uh, can be inhaled, can increase the risk of lung cancer, and uh, as well as other kinds of defects. It is extremely important to understand uh, how much radium is in that landfill, how much radon gas is being produced, and find ways of protecting both the workers and the people that live around the site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, David. Um, I'm questions because I can't see the questions. So either Rachel or Roger. Well, there we have one question to start with, and this may actually be a question for Roger because it's asking about the um, hazardous waste loophole, um, and uh, if the uh, closing that loophole in our law would alter the disposal of gas in our landfill, uh, of, of radioactive waste in our landfills, and so um, of, uh, of fracking waste. So, uh, well, Roger, very, do you want to? I think it's a very complicated question. I, I think it depends on how. DEC regards or you know what what it considers as hazardous um, clearly there's been some argument that they regard uh, drill cuttings going into landfills as uh, norm uh, naturally occurring radioactive material which they do not consider hazardous although I think it's difficult to argue that something that once was about 7,000 feet below the earth's surface and suddenly finds itself in the back of a truck, whether that is naturally occurring or not. Um, but I think that passing this law, uh, this law that would at least change our regulations to suggest that hazardous materials, by definition coming off of oil and gas sites, should be tested and considered hazardous, uh, I think is important. And I, I think that that passing this law would certainly invite greater scrutiny for what uh, you know, uh, the the uh, presenters are talking about today. And Roger, what is what's happening with legislation in Albany right now? Well, the bill itself, uh, it passed the Senate last year. It came very close to passing the Assembly. Um, but like everything else, uh, we are completely shut down uh, because of the coronavirus. The legislature is poised in the, the next uh, days to potentially um, pass a, a budget, even though they're having trouble meeting because of, um, you know, clear uh, safety issues uh, for staff and legislators. And they're, they're trying to work that out, uh, I think, in the next 48 hours in terms of remote voting or at least passing measures that would allow them to vote further. We really don't have any idea of what the rest of the legislative session looks like. Clearly, uh, while these are incredibly important environmental issues, uh, and there are many on the table right now, the focus is, is on the health and safety of New Yorkers through this pandemic crisis. Um, but I think that we are, we are in a good position at least to get a bill on the governor's desk if we can have the legislature um, have the, the time to to, to vote on it. Um, 
which still remains very uncertain. So I think it's up in the air and we won't know probably for weeks and months what the fate of it uh, this year is. So I, um, I invite people to put their questions on the chat feature or in the question feature, if you can see those. Um, so do we have questions? I, is there also a way, Roger, that people can raise their hands uh, if they wanted to ask a question? I don't, I don't really see that feature here. Um, okay. So. So I'm I'm just yes, uh, uh, you know I'm just getting a look at the the the, the questions now. I will try to uh, um, expand the box, and I'm I'm sorry. So you can't see those, Rachel. I take it. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. It's my fault. I see there are lots of questions, and I had not expanded the box. So, okay. So um, my um um. There is a question um, um, from Mary Finneran uh, about considering the lawsuit delay. I assume the expansion is also delayed. Um, no, the expansion is not delayed. Um, we ask, we have asked for an injunction, but our request for an injunction against construction of the expansion that our that a hearing on that is delayed, but uh, the expansion project itself is, uh, I believe, going forward because there's nothing that stops them from doing that. Um, now, um, there's a question here for um, Ray about the samples. Uh, the leachate test samples, how were the leachate test samples collected? Our understanding is that uh, a five gallon bucket is collected. We have not been present to actually witness this, nor have I actually seen video of how it's done, but uh, the rather sparse sample collection notes that are part of the analytical results describe a five gallon bucket being filled and then uh, I believe uh, typically uh, a few samples are then subsampled for each of the uh, each of the different uh, cells that are sampled. So they're uh, collecting a sample, I think, in a five-gallon bucket, and then pouring it into sample jars for at least two uh, jars per cell that's being sampled. And here's a question for Dr. Carpenter. What is hormesis, and why do they use that in other countries? Well, hormesis is a uh, it's a concept that there is not a linear dose response relationship, uh, and we we know for some chemicals that are endocrine disruptors that very low concentrations are are more toxic than higher concentrations. Uh, hormesis is not applicable to ionizing radiation, however. Uh, I, I showed you that that slide of, of radiation life shortening, an absolutely straight line. Uh, and it's in the case of ionizing radiation, it's very clear that more is worse and that uh, uh, it is not acting through the process of hormesis. Um, here's a question. I'll pose this to Dr. Vaughn. Um, are there other sources of radioactive materials in the landfill besides frac wastes that could be the source of radium? Uh, there are, of course, uh, naturally occurring uh, levels of radium, but at a very low level, typically about one picocurie per gram in the soils that are used for uh, covering. You know, those are necessarily part of the uh, landfill mix, but are very low levels. Uh, there are also possibly, and I don't know whether uh, Hakes receives a lot of this or not, but uh, Hakes is a construction and demolition debris landfill, a C and D landfill. And as such, it may be receiving quantities of fire brick. Uh, fire brick is typically uh, material that has elevated levels of radium in it. 
beyond that, uh, I haven't seen breakdowns of what the waste is, and I suspect that a lot of the C&D waste is not well characterized when it comes in. So um, here is a question about um, doing our own testing. Um, someone who purchased a, a hand radon detector for $200 could we, if we provided hand meters to all the residents that are close to the landfill, could we, what could we detect? Um, maybe I'll ask Dr. Carpenter if, uh, to address that first. Well, certainly if you had a good meter that monitored radon concentration, you could determine whether there's radon in the air. Uh, I think the issue there is that uh, the concentration is going to vary very much by uh, wind direction, wind speed, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think the the bigger issue that's posed by Ray's results would be to document what's coming off into the air from the landfill itself. Uh, you know, each individual is appropriately concerned about uh, what they're getting at their place. But I think that uh, DEC is just basically denying that there's this huge amount of release that raise results show is extremely likely. And the first issue would be to get good monitoring of the radon release from the landfill. Thank you. Um, and here's a question uh, about airborne r radon. Um, could that end up in local creeks that run near the landfill? Well, yes, it could. It's, uh, radon is not that water soluble. And so I think it's unlikely to be a problem in, in creeks. Uh, it would be a, more of a problem in groundwater if uh, the leachate were running into groundwater and people nearby were on wells. Uh, that would be a, an area that I would be more concerned about than just the radon in the creek water. Now, someone asked the question, what happens to someone that breathes 1 million picocuries per liter of radon? So that would be, I guess, someone directly uh, next to the landfill gas uh, emission system or something. But, uh, but high levels uh, of uh, every every bit of radon that you inhale increases your risk of lung cancer. Now, uh, you know that isn't to say that everybody that's breathing radon for 60 years is all they're all going to get lung cancer. But the risk of lung cancer is proportionate to how much radon you breathe. If you're a woman, it's more serious than if you're a man. And if you're young, it's more serious than if you're old in terms of the magnitude of the risk. But for everybody, the greater the amount of radon you breathe, the greater the risk of developing lung cancer. This is Ray, uh, Dr. Here's Vaughn. Let me add, let, let me add just a little bit to that. My best understanding, and I'd ask uh, Dr. Carpenter to respond to this, my best understanding is that the indoor guidance level of four Pico carries per liter radon uh, corresponds to a greater than one in one million lifetime risk of cancer from radon. There are other health effects as well, but uh, my understanding that uh, even the four Pico carry per liter indoor guidance level uh, is not designed to provide the one in one million uh, risk threshold that we often see advocated for. Uh, man-made hazards. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, they, the reality is that we all inhale radon on occasion. Uh, and so it's not realistic to think that we can all avoid any inhalation of radon. But the point is, these standards are set uh, to, to what, is a, what one can hope to achieve uh, but still, for ionizing radiation, we know that uh, there is no threshold of exposure that does not increase your risk of cancer to some degree. 
The one in a yeah. million is, is what EPA sets as a standard that's realistic to strive for. That still is a small elevated risk. And I think the, the, har the danger to people living nearby from right on off the landfill is probably not great. I would be more concerned about workers on the landfill where they're going to be exposed to higher concentrations coming off. Here's a question for Dr. Vaughn about the leachate samples. Why are the landfill leachate samples held for 21 days before being tested? Why not be, why aren't they tested sooner? The, the 21 day holding period is a fairly standard holding period for testing of samples that uh, may contain radium. And it's really designed to achieve secular equilibrium between radon, excuse me, between radium and its progeny. So the idea is to hold the sample for 21 days. If there's radium in the sample at say X picocuries per liter, then holding for 21 days will ensure that the progeny radon down, on down through uh, at least bismuth 214, those progeny will also achieve X picocuries per gram. So it is a standard test procedure to wait for 21 days. And here's another question for Dr. Vaughn. Um, why did DEC stop testing for um, the, the lead and bismuth? There's been a lot of controversy uh, about whether the method being used to do this testing, EPA method 901.1, is a valid test method or not. There are a lot of false or misleading claims about how it may not be a valid test method. For very low levels, it is not the ideal test method, but for detecting very high levels, it works very well. And part of the uh, demonstration that it is a good method is what I was talking about earlier, seeing how when lead 214 is high, bismuth 214 is also being measured as very high and vice versa. Uh, if it were a poor test method, it would not show that good correspondence between those two radionuclides being both high or both low in a given sample. And here's a question about the financial cost of uh, the radon detection. Um, are there, what are the financial or practical reasons for DEC to resist requiring the radon tests? Um, do either one of you want to answer that? Or I have, well, I have, I have to a comment too, just in regard to the lawsuit that we did offer to DEC uh, that if they would do testing um, and agree to certain tests, that we would even um, withdraw our lawsuit, and they have not done that. Um, in trying to analyze this, we um, think it may be possible that radon is coming out of the landfill gas emission system, and that we said that if it was, uh, we wanted further exploration uh, for uh, radium in the landfill, and we understand that it's not easy to test for the radon, but if those tests show high levels, then the next step is much more expensive. Um, and I'll let uh, Dr. Vaughn sort of talk about what might be uh, necessary to investigate radium in the landfill. Well, um, to the question itself, it's very hard, hard to understand exactly where DEC is coming from on this. Uh, so I can't really interpret, you know, why they are so resistant. DEC has required and still requires periodic testing of the uh, landfill gas at the flare for some of the chemical constituents. And it's unclear why they would simply refuse to engage in uh, testing for radon, which is a relatively straightforward test to collect samples for. As far as investigating the follow-up testing that might be needed if uh, if the testing of the landfill gas does show high levels of radon, 
it would be a variety of the things I've talked about already, namely uh, getting a better understanding of what the landfill gas flow pathways are, testing landfill gas radon concentrations, not only at the flare, but further upstream at the individual cells that are being uh, vented in the, the piping systems that then collect this all and send it to the flare, and taking a number of waste or soil samples as well in order to see whether a quasi-random sampling shows levels substantially greater than 25 picocuries per gram in the waste. And here's a question. Is there any way that leachate can concentrate radon above equilibrium? This is uh, Dr. Vaughn Dr. speaking. Dr. Vaughn? Uh, yeah, not, okay. not easily. Uh, the laws of thermodynamics generally indicate that uh, substances usually don't concentrate themselves. They usually mix and disperse. There may be ways that we haven't yet uh, understood that there could be some level of reconcentration. You certainly see this in the biological realm where uh, there's concentration up the food chain, bioaccumulation and so on. But in chemical processes, which is what we're dealing here, the way uh, these radioactive chemicals happen to interact with other radioactive chemicals and just with air and other non-radioactive substances, we usually do not see concentration of things that were originally more dilute. So more testing would provide a better answer to the question, but my best answer at this point is uh, you would need to show me a plausible process to how things can simply build up in concentration rather than gradually diluting themselves. And here's a question. Um, I'll take an initial stab at this question. Is Hakes, did Hakes take um, uh, liquid, gas drilling liquids, uh, like produced water, such as the Pennsylvania landfills did? Um, the original reports about Hakes from the Pennsylvania DEP database showed that, the, that Hakes did take barrels of liquid, but after we started our lawsuits, um, Hakes got those reports revised. They said those were mistakes, and the reports were advised, revised many years after the fact to say that Hakes did not take the liquids. So. Um, interpret that as you wish. Um, uh, there's a question here about the legislation. Um, what is the bill number? If people want to lobby for this or speak to their speak to their legislators, Roger, can you give us the bill number? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll bring it up and uh, on on the screen, and uh, and we can go with other questions. And uh, somebody asked about levels of uranium in the drill cuttings needed to sustain the high loads of radon. Uh, I mean, I guess, um, do you want to answer that question, Dr. Vaughn? Uh, the levels of uranium are also generally low in the leachate samples. Uh, I don't think uh, there's usually been a separate limit for uranium, I think the radium progeny of uranium are usually considered a good uh, characterization measure. But in the leachate, the, the uranium, uranium tends to be low. Uranium is not very water soluble, which is another reason it would be low in the leachate. Yeah. Well, we have, we are now about 10 minutes. I'm sorry. We're about 10 minutes past our um, uh, closing time, but I think if people still have questions, there are still questions here, 
if our speakers are willing to stay on for a few more minutes, we can um, we can discuss uh, a couple more questions. Um, there's one question here about the science. Was the science in this presentation available uh, during the uh, arguments against the expansion of the Shemung landfill? Uh, the um, DEC uh, did have, I believe, an issues conference in that uh, in that case, but did not de decided there was not um, a. Uh, uh, an issue that needed to be considered. Um, so I I don't the I don't believe that the, at that time the Shemung landfill had the leachate test results because that was one outcome of the earlier Shemung proceeding is that is that DEC did require the leachate testing. So that was an important step was getting now the leachate test results. Someone asked what gas drilling companies tell site workers about their exposure to radon. They provide protective material. Uh, I think we could we could expand this question to landfill workers as well. Um, Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Vaughn, do you know are, what uh, landfill workers might typically be told about about their exposures? This is Dr. Vaughn. I don't, I don't know. No. So that's a good question, but I don't think either of us knows at this point. I think it's very unlikely that any protective gear is provided to landfill workers. And here's a question what is required for gamma spectroscopy? Spectroscopy testing to resume. Um, Dr. Vaughn, do you want to address that? Well, it gets into a regulatory question that I don't fully understand. Uh, it has to do with the revision of the Part 360 landfill requirements that DEC uh, has written and uh, issued. The gamma spectroscopy requirements have been dropped, I think, generally from those requirements. And in turn, uh, that has led Hakes to say, and apply to DEC now about two years ago, saying, could we please drop these uh, tests as well? So uh, I don't know whether DEC would be willing to resume the tests, even though the Part 360 regulations don't currently require them or not. And here's a related question to that. What is the biggest controversy about why the EPA 901.1 methodology is not the optimum test for cuttings? My best understanding is that it involves the relatively large error bounds in the method 901.1 test. If you're testing a sample that has only, let's say, five picocuries per gram, or five picocuries per liter, depending on the medium being tested, uh, there's a concern that the error bounds may be, let's say, plus or minus six. And if your reading is five, that throws a lot of uncertainty as, into what the uh, actual number is. But on the other hand, if you're getting readings of 6,000, your error bounds are 600, that still gives you a very clear and urgent warning that you've got high levels. If you've got 6,000 plus or minus 600, your best understanding is that the sample contains somewhere between 5,400 and 6,600 picocuries per liter. And you know that should be interpreted. Any scientist who's paying attention needs to interpret that as a level that is high, regardless of whether at low levels, the precision of the uh, method is limited. And there's a question here about um, 
re, um, radioactivity testing requirements for gas drilling waste and landfill landfills uh, among other states and and uh, federal regulations uh, EPA uh, do uh, do we know the answer to <clears throat> comparing to other states? I have no idea. I don't know. Indeed. I think that it's yeah, an issue that other states have addressed, Pennsylvania and Colorado and uh, the EPA. I think um, there's not nearly as much testing <coughs> and reporting required as they should be, as there should be. Mm -hmm. And I think it's generally true that it is a state-by-state well, state matter. I, I don't know the requirements in each individual state except New York. And here's, I guess I'll, I'll leave this as a final question. You have suggestions uh, and, I hope, and for Roger and Kate, too. How can people get involved to work on this issue? Well, I, I would just say, you know, certainly with the legislation, uh, you know, we need support. We need folks to read out, reach out to their elected officials and ask them to co-sponsor, uh, ask them to um, move the bill to the floor. Clearly, that changes things now with this legislative session, but to, you know, continue to track it. But I think DEC also needs to hear from citizens that this is an issue of concern. Uh, and maybe using the legislation as a vehicle, reach out to the governor's office, reach out to DEC. Um, you know, we will find in the coming months, uh, you know, potentially we will do online campaigns and try to find a way to interact during this, this pandemic time. Uh, but, you know, I think doing that outreach is important. Uh, but certainly there's, there's important things for people on the ground in these communities. Uh, that have been really leading the fight, and uh, you know we, um, you know I, I don't know maybe you can speak to that, Rachel, um, how they can get involved in these particular cases, even though I know you know the the EIS is passed. Well, I think just publicizing what's happening and making sure that people understand. Um, making sure the public understands uh, that our elected representatives understand the circumstances at Hakes. Uh, and there is one more question I think is important here um, for Dr. Vaughn. Where, how did you get the data that you analyzed for Hakes? And it asks if, if that was obtained through the Freedom of Information Law. Yes, it was. Uh, and Freedom of Information Law has provided us with the uh, analytical results, which is typically a packet of about 30 pages, uh, providing some information on sample collection, although that's usually pretty sparse, and then the chain of custody documents, and then the lab reports. So that has been obtained uh, under Freedom of Information. Well, and, and so uh, me continuing to do. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Kate. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Even though the EIS is passed, it still can't hurt to let the DEC know that your uh, that folks are upset with their decision uh, about Hakes. Um, you know, uh, the uh, disgruntled public is always a uh, powerful tool. Um, You can always and it's let important the to know articulate. That... Go ahead, Rachel. Well, this issue about the EPA testing methodology, you know, their reason for stopping, uh, and and now they don't, you know, they're really, um, as, as Ray said, as a blind spot uh, in what's going on at Hakes. I think that's an important thing that uh, that to uh, ex explain, uh, Ray just explained that it is relevant, it is a good test. I think I'm, I'm stating this correctly. Um, 
if if um, the, the levels are high. But um, so we can we can work on some of the scientific fronts. We can get more data by uh, uh, coming up with ways of measuring and uh, just just helping to publicize. Rachel, this is Dr. Vaughn. Let me just uh, ask you to explain to people uh, who are still on the phone that uh, this is not the first presentation we've done. Uh, some of the work I've done already on the scientific background is on your website, uh, that 50-page memo I did a year ago, the affidavits I've submitted and so on, and likewise other material that Dr. Carpenter and uh, Dr. May have provided. Those are all on the your website if you want to explain about that. Yes, I. those are all of our filings in the case are posted on uh, my website, triclerlawoffice.com. Uh, and uh, you can, on the first page, you'll see the link to the Hague's Landfill. But we do have a lot of presentations, uh, our, our affidavits. Um, and we have, as exhibits to Dr. Vaughn's affidavits, we have all the Luce test results that he analyzed. So there's a lot of material and uh, uh, a lot for people to get involved with. And we're we're looking for more information too about the Shemung landfill and the Highland landfill in Allegheny County. We're monitoring all of these uh, three landfills that have been taking lots of drill cuttings. So there's a lot to be done. And uh, I think Roger is going to post the uh, the video of of this presentation, and we'll post the slides, our speaker's slides, on the Atlantic Chapter website, so you'll have access to this. And you can put a link put a link to the our legal papers and what's been filed. That's right. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you to our speakers and. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll send an email out to all participants uh, about how to how to find the slides and and uh, where where to look on the website. So, thank you all and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.